And if anyone has any issues with it, let me know, okay? So, uh, so yeah, I'm gonna go ahead and, and mute all, and we'll start the shiur. Okay. Let me just take this off. And let me just do this so we won't have interruptions. Okay, I, I'm, I'm new at this, so I'm learning about this, uh, <laughs> this waiting room and the bells and everything, but it all should be good now. Okay, so let's jump right into this week's Parsha, an amazing Parsha. Um, but let's again, let's again put things in perspective. So what happens is that, you know, we were going through... Um, we were going through, at, in the, way back in the book of Shemot, we had the Jewish people leaving Egypt. They come to, to Mount Sinai. At Mount Sinai, they receive the Torah. And then, you know, it takes 120 days total because after 40 days, they did the golden calf. And after, after that, uh, another 40 days of, uh, of fasting and prayer. And then another 40 days to get the second um, set of tablets. And Moshe Rabbeinu comes down finally with the second luchot, the second set of tablets. He comes down on Yom Kippur. The day after Yom Kippur, he gives the direction to go ahead and build the Mishkan, the tabernacle, the house of God. And that takes until, until Rosh Chodesh Nisan. And then um, there's the book of Leviticus and the whole story, the inauguration. And then we hear that on the second year, that means in the second year of when they left Egypt, in the second month, they're told to start traveling. And where are they traveling to? They're traveling to Israel. And that was the destination. God told Moses at the burning bush, which was on Mount Sinai, that we're going to stop at Mount Sinai to receive the Torah. And Laman Tavdun, they will learn to serve me at this mountain, and then from there, we're going to the land that God promised Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that he will give to their offspring. So this story that we start in this week's Torah portion is right at that place. So we're at the place where the Jewish people are ready to enter into Israel. And all of a sudden, the Jewish people say, one second, before we just walk into Israel, march in and then conquer it, uh, let's first see, let's first send some spies, let's go check out the land, let's see, you know, what it's all about, what kind of people are there, what kind of war it's gonna take to conquer them, you know, let's, get, let's, check, this, uh, let's check this scene out. And, Hashem, and our sages tell us, that Moshe Rabbeinu was put in a place, so to speak, as a broker. And, you know, brokering a deal, a real estate deal between God and the Jewish people. And Moshe Rabbeinu was kind of stuck, shall we say, in, in working the way brokers work. You know, the buyer is saying, one second, I want to see the place. I want to do an inspection, due diligence. And for Moshe Rabbeinu to have said, no, you can't. It's as is, take it or leave it. What's immediately going to go through the buyer's mind? Whoa, 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 whoa. What are we hiding here? So Moshe Rabbeinu was being very certain obviously he knows that this is the land that god's been promising for the last seven generations saying that it's the holy land the good land and then everything he's saying sure want to check it out check it out no problem when he he asks god about it god says what do you mean check it out they don't trust me and that's why you're going to see one extra word in the second verse of this week's torah portion shlach lecha Lecha means for your sake. And it shouldn't have said that. It should have just said, and God told Moses, send people. Why does it say, send for your sake people? And Rashi immediately tells us, because Hashem was saying, I am telling you no need. You want? According to your opinion. You think they should? Go ahead and do it. 
And Hashem then, Rashi tells us in the name of our sages, that Hashem made an oath. They don't want to work on faith. They want to work on tactics and logic. No problem. What we'll do then is we'll work with logic. And in human nature, there's always two ways to interpret things. And therefore, I am going to allow for that to happen. Everything I do to make this exposition work out well, they're going to be able to interpret it in a negative way. And so they did, as we will now see the story. I want to point out to you that in verse 3, when we talk about who Moses picked, he refers to them as Anoshim. Anoshim simply means men. But Rashi tells us that in the verses, it means men of, men of stature. Roshe ben Israel, leaders of the Jewish people. So these were people of spiritual stature. These were no goons. These were no John Doe's. These were serious, spiritual, righteous people. And thus Rashi tells us that at that moment, Shadim Hoyu, they were good people. I want to just point out that something that many people discuss is Rashi seems to contradict, contradict, contradict himself. Over here, he clearly says that, says that at this point, they were still good people with the right intentions. However, later on, the verse says, Vayelchu vayavau, they went and they came. And Rashi says, what, 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 why does it say they went? We know they went. We're now talking about that they came back. And Rashi quotes a teaching from our sages. From here we know that they went and came with the same evil plan. They were wicked from the onset, which seems to be contradicting what he's saying right now. I just wanted to point it out to you. Many discuss this. However, be it as it may, our, uh, the verses start listing up who each one of these people are. The two that you will notice, you will recognize, is the tribe of Judah was represented by Kalev ben Yefune, who the Talmud tells us was Miriam's husband, which means that he was Moses' brother-in-law. Interesting. The second thing I want to share with you is, the second person you're going to recognize is from the tribe of Ephraim was Moshe Rabbeinu's star um, student, loyal student, who would later be his successor, Hoshea Ben Nun. So we know him as Yehoshua, Joshua. And really his name was originally Hoshea. It, you're going to see that the last thing Moses does before he sends them is he adds on a Yud to Hoshea's name, making him Yehoshua which now means Yud Vav, the letters of God's name, will, should help you. He prayed for him that he should help you. And Moses had, and, and I'm sorry, the Rebbe of blessed memory has an unbelievable explanation. Why did Moses pray specifically for Joshua? Why not for Kalev? Kalev had to go pray by himself at, at the grave sites of our forefathers, the patriarchs and the matriarchs. Why did Moshe single out Joshua for prayer? An interesting conversation. However, let's first go through the story and then we can get into some deeper insights. So I want to just point out to you that in Hebrew, to spy means liragel. A spy is called meragel. In plural, meraglim. You will not find anywhere that Moses calls them spies, or tells them to spy. Rather, you'll find always Moshe Rabbeinu telling them Latur, which means to explore. A tourist is called a Tayar. To tour the country is called Latur, the Tayar. And Moshe Rabbeinu was not asking them to spy because spying would only be necessary if we had to worry about tactics of conquering. Being that this was going to be God's war, Moshe Rabbeinu felt no need to spy. Rather, Moshe Rabbeinu was telling them, explore the land. 
and Moshe Rabbeinu gives them some telltale signs to know about the land and about his people by seeing their behaviors. One of the examples is if they live in unwalled cities, you know that they're strong and they don't feel the need of protection of large walls. If they're in walled cities, you know that they don't rely on their own strength and they need uh, fortification from walls. Um, just to point out to you, uh, we talk about the seven nations, we talk about the 10 nations that made up Israel, but just that so you should know, there were 31 kings, 31 kingdoms that ruled in Israel. Now, another thing, very interesting, the verse 20 points out to us that it was the time of spring. And why, why do we tell that? It, it, you'll see that it was the season when the first grapes ripened. And the reason why our sages tell us is that again, Hashem is making sure that everything should be as comfortable and as easy as possible. Now, moving right along here with the story, um, uh, Moshe Rabbeinu tells them how they should travel through exploring the length and the width of the entire country. And he tells them to bring back um, fruits from the Holy Land. And then in chapter 20, I'm sorry, in verse 21, um, they're, on their, they're on their way. And immediately they come across the first thing that they see, which once again leads to them being able to interpret things in a negative fashion. And that is that they come, uh, uh, they come across the remnants of very large people, literally called giants. Now, I want to share with you something, and it's very timely. Um, next week, Thursday, is going to be the yard site of the Rebbe, the anniversary of the passing of the Rebbe. Um, and, and I'm seeing if it's possible to go ahead and drive down to New York just to spend a couple of hours there. I'll stay Shabbat with my sister and come back. So, you know, this whole notion of going to pray at the burial site of a tzaddik Actually, the first time we find it in the Chumash is in this week's Torah portion, when our sages tell us that Kalev, hearing and learning of the evil plot of his fellow spies, he breaks away from them and goes to Hebron and goes to Kiryat Arba and goes to Ma'arat Machpelah to go ahead and pray there. By the way, in this group, we are very fortunate that with us is actually a woman that grew up there, Orit, um, grew up in the holy city of Hebron. Hebron is one of the cities that when we refer to it till this very day, we actually write the acronym for Ir HaKodesh, the holy city. Now, what happens here is that he prays and then he, uh, he joins them. And they go ahead and they take from the fruits. And after 40 days, they're returning. And it shouldn't have gone that quickly. Um, you know, they didn't exactly have jeeps at the time. Uh, but again, our sages are taught because God foresaw that there's going to be the, the uh, punishment of a day for a year for a day, a year for a day. Hashem quickens things up. Let it just be 40 years. And we're soon going to talk about why it was 40 days. So it could be 40 years. Now, they come back. And they start giving a report. And the verse tells us in 26 that everyone gathers together. Let's hear the report. What is this land that's going to become the homeland of the Jewish people? Now, they start telling the story that, yes, it's good. There's fruits. There's everything. The Talmud in Sota tells us that from this we learn out there's no way a lie will be accepted if there isn't some basis of truth. And that's why every lie, a person sticks in a basis of truth so that it will have some validity and you can sell the non-truth with it. And then in, in verse 28, they start giving their opinions. 
and their opinion is, we will not be able to conquer this land. This land is too strong for us. And in order to really scare the Jews, they make mention of their old enemy, the first one that attacks them when they come out of Israel, which is Amalek, says you should know that Amalek is there and it's not good. We're not going to be able to conquer them. In verse 30, Kalev silences them. Now the question is, what does it mean he silenced them? Why does he say the word silence? It should just said. And Kalev said, not true, not true. We can do this. So our sages tell us that Kalev saw that the chaos energy was taking over the masses. And therefore, he knew he would first have to silence them to get them to want he, to hear what he's saying. And right now, that they're all caught up with this report of the 10, the 10 bad spies, he, they don't want to hear him. So what does he do? He has to start off as if he's part of the team. And what does he start off with? Our sages say, he starts off with the words, really? Is this the only thing that Moses did, for, did to us? And they all thought, oh, oh, oh we're going to hear some more gossip on Moshe. And everyone gets quiet. And, he's, and then he starts saying, did Moses not split the sea for us? Did Moses not bring water from a rock? Did Moses not bring us the manna? Did Moses not protect us with clouds of glory? And, and so forth and so on. And all of a sudden they realized they're hearing already what he's saying, but that wasn't what they were expecting. Now, the, the 10 spies that means the 12 minus Caleb and Joshua that were saying bad, they said that there's no way we will be able to conquer, and they spoke gossip against the people. Verse 33 is an amazing verse. Verse 33 says, And there we saw the giants, the son of giants, and we were in our eyes as grasshoppers, and so we were in their eyes. And of course, the sages ask, and they have two opinions. They ask, how do you know how you looked in their eyes? You know how you thought you looked in their eyes. And over here, and we're gonna talk about this, when, you know, when we finish going through the Torah portion. Over here, we see that it's all about projection. If you see yourself as grasshoppers in the face of your enemy or whatever we're going to say, your antagonist, you're going to project not that you see yourself as a grasshopper. You're going to project that they see us as grasshoppers. When in truth, what you think they see is nothing more than your projection. And this is important in relationships. Most often, when we project that we have a problem with self-respect, we will immediate, immediately interpret what others say to us as them being disrespectful. And really what it's all about is it's coming from me being projected on him or her, and thus that is what I see in him and her towards me. And well, we're gonna focus on this a little more. But let's first go through the story. Chapter 14, verse one, and it says, on that night, they cried. They cried all night. Our sages tell us that God said, oh, you're crying for nothing. Don't you worry. This night is yet going to be a night for which you'll truly have what to cry. <laughs> it's funny, because when I learned these, uh, these words of the sages, <laughs> I almost heard God speaking the way parents speak to your, your, their kids. If you don't stop crying, I'll give you what to cry for. <laughs> but that's not exactly what God said. He didn't say if you don't stop crying. He said you're crying for nothing. You're going to have what to cry about. And actually... Our sages tell us that this is the day of which temple number one and temple number two was in the future destroyed, Tisha B'Av. It was, it was, they opened up the gateway 
to a day that would have energy of pain and suffering. Okay, let's move right along here then. And they start saying, Oi, why, if only we would have stayed in Egypt, if only we would have died in Egypt, why do we have to come out of Egypt to what? To witness our children being slaughtered and taken as slaves and our wives taken as maids and, and, and us being slaughtered. Why do we have to do this? Let's go back. And in verse number five, Moses and Aaron literally feel faint and fall upon their faces. And Rashi tells us that Moses and Aaron already felt the strain of how many times did they intercede on behalf of the Jews to ask God to forgive. And they felt it's getting difficult. How many times can we expect to be able to arouse compassion in time of anger in a place of deserved retribution? And nevertheless, Kalev and Joshua, they stand up against the masses and they say that that's not true. We can conquer them. We will conquer them. If God so desires, they'll be like bread in, in our hands. Now, I want to just point out a couple of things before we go further. When Kalev and, and uh, Yeshua we're telling the Jewish people, we don't have what to worry about. They use over here an interesting saying, Sar Tzilam Me'alehem. Their protective shade was removed from them. Now, when you follow through the stories of the Torah, let me just take you, for example, to the story of Abraham arguing with God not to destroy Sodom, and the other, the total of five cities on that continent, on that rock. And he argues that if there's 10 people, and in this right, he goes 50, it means 10 in each one, or nine in each one. So this, what was he doing? What he was doing was that he knew that the way of God is that when you have a righteous person in the midst, the zechut, the merit of that righteous person protects over all of them. So much so that later on when Moses has to go to war for over the, this, the other side of the Jordan to conquer, he himself was afraid at one point. And Hashem says, you have nothing what to afraid, be afraid no more because it was removed from them. Hashem is just. And if there is a righteous one out there, then Hashem will postpone the Jewish people being able to conquer it because the merit of the righteous that lives amongst the, the nation that they're going to conquer protects them. Thus, are, the Joshua said and Caliph said, all we really had to worry about was the righteous one amongst them because Hashem would protect them in merit of the righteous one. Who was the righteous one there? Job. And the, ver the sages tell us that when they said over here that God removed, their, their, it was removed from them, their protection, what it means is that Job, it came the end of his life and he passed away. And thus we have nothing to worry about no more whether the, the attribute of justice of God would demand you can't destroy the enemy yet because they have merit. Now. On the same note, I want to point out something else to you. Remember I told you God said, I will allow for inter misinterpretations of what I'm doing. There is a verse here that the other spies said that we see that this is an Eretz Ochelet Yoshveha. This is a land which is eating up its inhabitants. And our sages tell us Simply speaking, they saw that there was funerals all over the place. And they're saying, whoa, what is going on here? This is an unusual amount of funerals at one time for such a population. And they saw it as a bad sign. The land causes death. Our sages tell us, Hashem said, really? I made all these deaths pile up in these 40 days. 
that you would be touring and exploring their land in order that they should be too busy to notice what are these foreigners looking around everywhere and what are they doing? They look like spies. I did this to help you and protect you. And you come along and say, no, this is an evil thing. I want to again fall back on what I spoke about in the grasshopper scenario. And what I want to say is, it is always about the paradigm and the lenses. If I come from a paradigm that God doesn't like me, God picks on me, why always me? Then no matter what happens in my life, I will always see it in that sense. Almost like the cup's half full, half empty. But over here, I'm actually saying that it's not the cup's half full, the cup's half empty. The same cup, if I come from a certain paradigm, I will see that it's full of poison and disgusting stuff. And that's all that God serves me. And if I come from a different perspective, a perspective that God is good and God loves me, I will always see the healthiest and most tastiest drink is what God is serving me. And you'll find this over and over in our personal lives. There's a certain paradigm that we create. And, and of course, there's a reason why. Why would a human being go there? You, every, every normal, healthy baby is born smiling, expecting the entire world to evolve around it. Something happens there that damages and creates a very non-human paradigm. Because the human paradigm from birth is one of gratitude, one of feeling loved, one of feeling untouchable. Something happens that changes that. That's something to work out with a therapist. But I just want to say that how we perceive life has very little what to do with what God does or doesn't do for us, but rather how we choose to perceive what God does or doesn't do for us. Simple case at hand, um, and, and I don't wanna to take too much time here, but simple case at hand, this time of isolation, of quarantine, for some people, it was the most therapeutic, medicinal, paradise life, moments of being able to refocus, find inner peace, calmness, family time, time with self, time with God. And for others, it was crazy. It was the worst thing and that's all they know about this. It really has very little what to do with what really happened, but rather in how we choose to perceive what happened which has a lot what to do with how we choose to perceive ourselves and project ourselves onto the situation. And we'll stop here for a moment, and then with this, we'll soon go back to this topic, but I wanna just tell, tell you the rest of the story. So here is a mind, a mind boggler. So everyone knows how many men do you need for a minion, men over the age of 13. And, and we can have the conversation why men or what's about women, but for right now, let's just not go there. If you want to go there later in the Q&A, vakasha. But for right now, we know that for a minion, you have to have 10 males over the age of 13. And no, you can't have a Zoom meeting. It's got to be no virtual, but true reality. Now, what happens here is that God tells Moses, how long will this evil congregation now when you want to know what the definition of a congregation is you need to look through the torah and find the smallest number of people that god or the torah refers to as a congregation the smallest number that we find is in this story 12 spies two of them are good 
10 are bad, and God calls these 10 a bad congregation, Ada. Thus, we know that the minimum amount of people that can form a quorum that's called a congregation is 10. Some sages, this is all from the Talmud, some sages don't like this for simple reason. Really? We're going to learn out the most powerful part of prayer, which is about having not alone praying, but the power of a group. We're going to learn that out from a bad story. So they try to learn it out from a different verse. But I just want to tell you, the most famous is right here. Now, Mo God tells Moses that that's it. I'm wiping them out. But how can you wipe them out? You promised Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that their offspring is going to get the land. So God says, I'm going to wipe them out. You are an offspring of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And if I rebuild a people from you, I will be keeping my promise because your offspring will be the offspring of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Kept my promise. Don't have to deal with these guys no more. I'm done. Moses' approach in prayer is very interesting. Now, unfortunately, for many years, I struggled with what Moses did. Because if it's one thing that I have a personal animosity to, because of my own experiences in life, I hate having to witness manipulation. It seems to be that Moses is manipulating God. And he tells God that if you're going to kill the Jewish people, you are going to end up with a bad name. Because what the people are going to say is, aha, so he, this God of the Jews, had a great plan. And he was strong enough to do the first part of the plan. He was able to take out one king and one nation, namely Pharaoh and Egypt. Now when he's pulling up to the border of Israel, the promised land that he swore he's going to give his kids, his nation, his people, what happens? Ah, now he sees his 31 kings. And he, oh, this I can't do. But I got to save face. I can't have the Jewish people all of a sudden, sorry guys, change of plan, we're going to Uganda. That can't happen. And thus, he wiped out his people. End the story. I was going to bring them. I was going to bring them. They couldn't last. What can I do? So God, Moses is telling God, this isn't about the Jewish people. This is about you. Now, why am I bothered by this? Again, the same theme that I'm living with in this Torah portion. <laughs> For those of you who know me, my classes really tell you where I am in life. <laughs> because the Torah portion is layers and layers and layers. You experience it through what you're experiencing in life. This issue of thinking that Moses was manipulating God comes from, uh, for me, I'm talking about, comes from this absolute self-centeredness in which I am struggling to believe that Moses really meant what he was saying, regardless of what will happen to the Jewish people. Because if I was the one talking, I can tell you right now that this is only in a manipulation to get what I want. I want the Jews not to be killed. So I'm manipulating God, telling him, ah, this doesn't look good for you. That's not Moses. Moses truly believed in what he was saying. He meant what he was saying. And he was dealing with two problems. Problem number one, Moses lived for the sanctification of God's name. And to think that there would be the ultimate desecration of God's name was something he was going to fight with tooth and nail. And even though what God was doing was right and just, but he was worried about the perception of the human beings. He meant what he was saying. And then he meant the next piece of what he was saying. Have compassion for your children. 
Nothing was a manipulation. Everything was a prayer from the core of his being. And then he says, Yigdal no, please empower, empower your attribute of compassion to forgive your children. And in verse 18, he falls back on what God has taught him in the aftermath of the golden calf. God taught Moses the 13 attributes of, of mercy. Now within the 13 attributes of mercy, because that is all about God, not about what we deserve or don't deserve. It's about God's goodness. And thus God's goodness doesn't have to be confined if only you deserve it. And thus he was asking God, it's about your compassion. And your compassion is big enough even for those that don't deserve it. And God says, I'm, I will forgive them. I will not wipe them out. I will not obliterate the Jewish people and restart from you. However, those who spoke against the land will not get to see the land. It will be their offspring that will get to see the land. And now I'm going to take you back to why was it 40 days so that it would only be 40 years. Now, you and I know that the Jewish definition of an adult for a male, it's 13 years old. For a female, it's 12 years old. In truth, that is only a rabbinic estimation because in certain areas, for example, when you use witnesses for a marriage, what are certain laws where you really need to make sure that we're dealing with adults, you cannot go by the 13th birthday because the halachic definition of an adult is actually on the, the body's development. For a male, it has to do with the pubic hair, on the arm hair, it has to do with the beard. For the women, it has to do with development of her chest and also with the hair. So we have the bar of bat mitzvah, and then we have the physical development of the body, which shows us that there has been a maturity. Now, just for my two cents, take it for whatever it's worth. I did not see this in any book. But if you read, you're going to see why the next stage in heaven, you're not faced with the responsibility and accountability of your actions until you're 20 years old. Now, I read in science that the reason why we should never know from it but the reason why there is such a high suicidal rate amongst teens is because their synaptic connections in their brain has not tightened yet enough for them to maturely be able to understand and experience risk. Thus, even from a biological point of view, we have scientific proof to why the age should be 20. With that being said, now because God doesn't hold you accountable for having retribution until the age of 20, and God told Moses, I'm gonna let this generation live. And the definition of living is to 60 years old. And according to, it depends, the verse is 70 and then 60 if, if, you're, if, you're, uh, if you're subjected to spiritual death, whatever it may be. Bottom line is, they were going to live until 60. So therefore, God says, I'm going to punish everyone that was 20 years old. They're not going to die until they turn 60. So therefore, we'll spend 40 years in the desert, so that in the 40th year, this entire generation that was accountable for what happened when they spoke against the land will not be there to enter the land. Now, I just want to throw at you just for the, the you know, I, li I like when I give you some background traditions and oral commentary. It just, it, it makes the parsha three-dimensional. I just want you to know that there, the, according to our sages, that the year that the person would turn 60, on the day that they cried, remember I told you it was Tisha B'Av, on that day, they would first dig a grave. They would go to sleep in the grave knowing that they would not wake up tomorrow because that was the day where Hashem 
said, all those who are 60 in this year, your life is complete. When it came to the 40th year, and they went and they did the same thing, they woke up the next morning, they're still alive. Okay, they thought maybe they miscalculated, whatever, whatever, whatever. After five days, they realized, no, it's over. That fifth day from when they started counting is the eve of Tubish of Tuba of, the day that we call the Jewish Valentine's Day. One of the reasons why that is a yuntiv is because that's when they realized it's over. That whole decree is over. We're ready to go into Israel. Just giving you some oral uh, tradition background. Anyway, the, tw- the 10 spies died immediately. They didn't get to live till 60. And then the next thing that happens is very amazing. All of a sudden, we, we you know, simply speaking, we don't know why. Oh, I should tell you, I'm sorry. There's an aftermath story. Oh, my God, I almost skipped it. The, the day after they heard how angry God was, quote, unquote, um, and I say, quote, unquote, because does God get angry? Does God have good moods, bad moods? A different conversation. But the bottom line is that when they saw God's reaction, the attribute that reacted to what they did, they decided, oh, my God, this was, this is, we did wrong. So the next morning, a group tells Moses, we made a mistake. We're going up. And we're going to fight war. And Moses says, don't. God told you that plan A, you botched. We now have plan B. Do not go because you will not succeed. And thus, what ends up happening? They don't listen. They go. And sure enough, the Amaleks come and attack them. And it wasn't a good. After that, the next thing that happens is very interesting. It seems to be in no in no relationship to anything. God starts telling them the laws of when they go into Israel. And one of the laws that the first law that God tells them is the famous mitzvah that women do, which is that when you bake challah, don't get me wrong, if men do it, if men bake, they have to also do it. But normally the challah is one of the mitzvahs that the women do. They bake challah, they bake the breads, and the law is that you have to take a piece of the dough it's a whole calculation, depending if you're a home baker or you're a business baker. Simply speaking, 48, this, a dough the size of 48 uh, compica eggs size of a dough. And you take a piece, you make a blessing, and that goes to the Kohen. Today, we can't give it to the Kohen because the food has holiness, and thus, we destroy it. Now, I want to just tell you there are different opinions. One of the opinions I grew up with was, that you took the dough, you wrapped it in silver foil, you put it into the oven, and you let it burn. Later, when I grew up, I found out that there's an opinion that's very against this. How can you actively destroy something which is called holy? Thus, their custom is you don't burn the dough. You just allow the dough to just become spoiled by not baking it. And then later... That, you know, it's spoiled, so now it doesn't have that law. Others say keep it in your freezer until you burn the chametz, whatever. I'm just telling you, that's the law. That's the mitzvah. Now, the question is, why all of a sudden, after such a horrific story, do we all of a sudden have this mitzvah? I just want you to know that the answer that Rashi tells us in the name of our sages is that really this mitzvah was all about comforting the Jews. Because the mitzvah starts, and it shall be when you come into the land. And what that actually means is that God was telling them, I'm serious. The land is yours. You're going to come to that land. Only not those who spoke against it, their offspring. So immediately giving them a mitzvah that is dependent upon coming into the land was actually giving them condolence and comfort of letting them know, I'm never going to walk away from you. I'm never going to give this land to anyone else. You are my people, and this is your land. And you're going to have to wait now 40 years. Then, then there's other laws that have, to, that have to do, but I want to just take you to the last piece, and then I want to focus on, on what we were talking about until now. In the last piece of this week's Torah portion, you know that the Shema Yisrael, as we know it, is made up of three portions. 
The prayer, the hero, Israel, God is our God, God is one, is made up of three portions. Portion number one comes from Deuteronomy, and the portion called the Eschanan. And in that portion, we talk about accepting God as our king, hero, Israel, God is our God, God is one, love him with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. The second portion is also from Deuteronomy, and that is all about accepting his mitzvot, and thus the portion talks about, and if you will follow and heed my mitzvot, and if you don't, the third portion is from this week's Torah portion. It's the portion called tzitzit. Now, I want to just briefly and quickly tell you about the mitzvah of tzitzit. The mitzvah of tzitzit is that if you wear a four-cornered garment, you have to wear on each corner the tassels. And the tassels in the day of old used to have one blue thread and the rest were white. That does not exist today because we do not know which is the blue, which from what we make. It had to be made from a specific, an argument, what it was, whether it was a, a type of scale, whether, uh, a snail, whether it was a type of fish, whether it was a type of octopus, or whatever, different opinions. But either way, because we don't know which one it is, so therefore we don't use it because you're not allowed to use a fake one. Now, I will tell you that two generations ago, there was a very great tzaddik. His name was Rajin. He was from the Rajina. And he, he says that he figured out which one it is, which is why today you might see certain people having one blue thread. When they came to the fifth Lubavitcher Chedeba and they asked him about this, he said, it can't be the right one because the great Kabbalist from Isaac Luria said, that the tchelet, the blue color, and exile cannot be at the same time. We won't have it in the time of exile. Being that we're still in exile, he said this is the proof that what they found isn't the right one. However, that is the last portion of this week's Torah portion, which talks about the tzitzit. I will tell you that while we don't find a connection between this last piece of the portion and the previous part of the portion, you don't simply see it, but we do have a connection between this and the beginning of the next week's portion where Moses' cousin rises up to rebel against him and he uses this commandment in his rebellion. That will wait till next week. I want to just briefly share with you and just come full circle with what I was sharing with you. And, it, and it's in the email, the, the weekly email that I sent out today, if you want to read it. So what we're saying here is that the true character defect behind the sin of the spies, which later caught like wildfire to the Jewish people, was that of low self-esteem to no self-esteem to no self-respect. We're grasshoppers. It, we, we should be living in the desert. We can't conquer and maintain a land. We're just not cut out for that. We don't have what it takes. On a mystical level, the 10 spies were saying, we can't be spiritual while engaged in a physical environment. Let's stay in the desert, surrounded by clouds, eating manna, drinking water from a rock. We're going to start getting involved with armies and agriculture and technology. We're not going to be spiritual people. We're too weak for that. So from one hand, what they were projecting was that we are grasshoppers. Just be happy with the little morsels get, that get thrown our way. But this isn't our world. We're unwanted guests that at best are tolerated by the UN and the nations of the world. Now that level, that character defect, of not being able to see who we are is was what lies beneath everything that went wrong. Now, what I am going to suggest is not only is that the character defect which made us not want to go into Israel, but that is the exact character defect which later made us say, we're going. Now, I'm going to suggest something that's very well discussed in psychology, that whenever you find an egotistical maniac, you're truly looking at a very insecure person 
who has no self-worth. Because people who are secure and have self-worth, they don't need to be egotistical maniacs. They're quiet and comfortable in their skin. Now, if we look into what Joshua, I'm sorry, what Caleb says, and later what Moses says, we're going to find what's going on here. We can, we will be able to conquer them. And then Caleb gives a stipulation. Im chafet Hashem banu, if God desires us. And what I want to suggest here is that understanding a true understanding of self-worth can never be absent of our relationship with God and who we are to God. If I'm just going to focus on who I am, of course I have no self-worth and self-respect. Because who I am in my own right, the verse already told me, from dust you came and to dust you will return. And the in-between is pretty shaky in itself. So what's really happening here is that my self-worth has to be built upon not what I see myself as, but what God sees me as. And I have to have my self-worth built upon not all my great talents and superior intellects, but my self-worth has to primarily be on my beingness of being God's child. Thus, when Jekale responds and says, what are you talking about, grasshoppers? It's God who desires us. How can we be a grasshopper? Then later, when the Jewish people, some of them, try to react to their character defect by going the opposite extreme, we're going. Moses tells them, you don't get it. It's not about having the self-respect of, like, you know, what's, the, what's that? Uh, I think my, my son used to have those books. Thomas. Thomas the Train. I can't do it. I can't do it. I can't do it. And that's, he got, that's not what it's about. What it's about is, and Moses tells them, God is not going with you. It won't work. Thus, you have the two sides of coins of struggling with self-respect. I'm not nothing, and I'm not everything. But what I am is the child of God. That is my beingness. I am a divine being having a human experience. And the only divine being there that exists is God. So I am a child of God. Thus, I have self-respect. Thus, I have belief in myself. I'm done. I'm unmuting. Go ahead, everyone. You can go ahead and share. Anybody? You know what? I'll shut the recording for this part so everyone can feel very comfortable.